Racism, it's a topic that is widely discussed today. There are many, many books and articles and discussions on racism. But what exactly is it? How are we to define it? And most importantly, what does the scripture have to say about it? And so before we dive into our passage today, I just wanna point out two things. First, I and our church, we strongly believe in the authority of the Bible. God's word. And so, because God's word is authoritative, infallible, inerrant, it's without error, it's trustworthy, then we must go to the scriptures and allow the scriptures to speak. So, from this sermon, my desire and hope is that we would see the scriptures for what it is and not just take what I say because I'm black. Like the Bereans, who after hearing Paul preach, they would examine the scriptures to see if what he was saying was true. So examine the scriptures, brothers and sisters. That's the first one. Secondly, well, we're going to be in James 2, so you can, you can turn there for now. Uh, the word racism is very interesting. A lot of people use the word racism, and what they mean by that is that they are talking about discrimination against someone who has a different ethnicity or nationality. And so biblically speaking, there is one human race. That is that we all have descended from Adam and Eve. And if you look at Acts chapter 17, Paul speaks about how God created one man, and then from one man, many nations. It was after the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 that God scattered the people, that there were various languages. And so through scripture, we see various people groups, nations, languages, there's a diversity there. But for our purposes, we are going to use the terminology that James uses, which is partiality. James chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 13. Well, before we read that, I just want to read another portion of James because I am feeling the weight of this topic. I'm feeling the weight of preaching right now, and I want to show you why, James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So I need you guys 
brothers and sisters to pray for me and pray with me as we begin this discussion. Father, I'm unworthy to preach your word. But I know and trust in the power of your word, the power of your gospel, and the power of your Holy Spirit. So I pray that you would help me to preach with clarity. You would help me to preach faithfully that we might behold Jesus Christ. And I pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. James chapter 2. I believe what James is trying to get across here to the Christians is that Christians love their neighbor by not showing partiality. Christians truly love their neighbor, those around them, by not showing partiality or favoritism, especially in the context of the local church. And so we're going to look at this in, in three points. First one, making distinctions makes you the judge. Second, you fulfill the law by loving your neighbor. Third, God is the lawgiver and judge. First, making distinctions make you the judge. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7 here. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Now we have to remember that when James or another author in the Bible, as when we start in a, in a different chapter like chapter 2, we have to remember that this is a letter. There were no chapter divisions. And so he's continuing his letter. And the theme of, of the rich and the lowly is something that he br already brought up in chapter 1. You see that in verses 9 through 11. But James makes a point to emphasize the unity in the church. He says, my brothers. Then further down, he says, my beloved brothers. This is important because the people of God are a family. They hold the faith of Jesus Christ and they're united together by faith in him. So that's the picture that he wants his readers, his audience, to remember. They hold the faith of Christ, who is the glorious one. And then he gives an illustration of partiality or favoritism. Two men walk into your assembly or your gathering. One is rich. He has a gold ring. He has fancy clothing, nice shoes. And what do you do? You give him the seat of honor. And then there's another man who walks in. He's poor, you can tell by his clothes. Shabby clothing. Dirty. Perhaps holes in his clothes. In his shoes, if he even has any shoes. And James says that this is partiality. Partiality. 
You're making distinctions, and as a result, you are mistreating the poor. Now, think for a second. Why would it be that someone would do this? Why would someone elevate, in this context, the rich in expense for the poor? Well, there's various reasons. One might be because this person wants to associate with the rich. If you can associate with the rich, then you are seen as rich yourself. Perhaps you want that status. Perhaps you want acceptance from people. Perhaps you want to be well-liked. Perhaps there's insecurity. You know, at times when we are insecure, we will put other people down so that we can feel better about ourselves. I remember growing up, I would use humor to put other people down. I would use humor to walk all over people so that I would feel better about myself because of my insecurity. And that is what James could possibly be addressing here. But the point is that you are treating this person as less than human. You are degrading another human being. Which is interesting because James later on goes to talk about how all human beings are made in the image of God. And that is a point that we as a church must remember that every human being, regardless of economic status, regardless of skin color, regardless of, you ready for this one, political affiliation, and we'll talk about that more next week, Regardless, every human being is made in the image of God and has dignity. So why is it that you treat them as less than? James says you have become judges. And not good judges, judges with evil thoughts. Know that partiality stems from within. Favoritism stems from within. Discrimination stems from within. And James calls that evil and wicked, and so should we. But notice the reversal. He says, has not God chosen those who are poor? That's fascinating, because God chooses the unlikely. We actually see this in the message of the cross. It is through death that we are made alive. God chooses his son to suffer so that we can receive the righteousness of God. The world thinks that that's foolish. That's crazy. That's bizarre. But that's the message of the gospel that saves people and transforms people. God has chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich, not with wealth, but spiritually speaking. That those who have nothing have it all in Christ. Rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. It's amazing how James plays on these words. The rich are the ones who have a lot of money. And let me just clarify, being rich in itself isn't sinful. What James is addressing are those who put their trust in riches. The rich are the ones who have a lot of money and probably have an inheritance for them, for their children, for their grandchildren, 
But James says God chooses the poor to be heirs of the kingdom. What's better than that? (laughs) To be heirs of the kingdom of God. To have a king who sits on his throne in heaven right now who dearly loves his people. That we, the people of God, are chosen by God, loved by God, and heirs of his kingdom. But what have you done? James says you have actually dishonored the poor man. Here's the irony. The very ones that you want to elevate, the rich, the very ones that you want to honor, are the very ones who mistreat you. James says, are not the rich the ones who oppress you? the ones who drag you into court probably so they can get more money. I think this is interesting for us today because our our nation, sadly even churches, are very divided over the issue of partiality. And sometimes in, in a desire to elevate one group of people, You forget that these are the same people who are mistreating you. James says, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? They blaspheme the name of God. So what does James call us to do? Well, this helps us to segue into our second point. It's that you fulfill the law by loving your neighbor. James chapter 2, 8 through 11. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. What is James speaking about in regards to the royal law? Uh, well, he quotes the Old Testament. He quotes Leviticus 19.18, which says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we actually see this in the gospel accounts where Jesus talks about the greatest commandment being loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind and loving your neighbor as yourself. So James says, if you do this, you are doing well. Now, just to clarify, James is not saying that you can earn your standing before God. Verse 10, he speaks about how if you've broken one, you're guilty of all of it. We actually needed one who obeyed the law perfectly on our behalf. And so those who put their trust in him now stand before God as righteous. But it doesn't stop there. In fact, those who are now Christians are different now. You are now enabled to love people. Isn't that amazing? People who are different than you. People who have different skin color. Different status in society. You can love them. Think about it. How is it that we treat people 
who walk through our doors on a Sunday morning. How is it? How are we doing at loving our neighbor? And our neighbor, as as Jesus points out in the parable of the Good Samaritan, guess what? That's everyone. (laughs) There's no exclusion there. We're called to love everyone. And how are we doing with that? Individually, but also as a church. But I think we forget that we are now new creatures in Christ. We have a changed heart, a heart that wants to love people. Now, maybe you're thinking, I don't know about that. It is hard to love certain people. I heard someone say amen. (laughs) (laughs) But we have to remember that God loved us and continues to love us even in the midst of our sin. And so we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can love people. But, there's a contrast here, James says, but if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law. Remember, James says that when you make these distinctions, you have become judges. You are deciding who's good and who's not. It's from your heart that these thoughts come, and then it's displayed. But notice, James says if you show partiality, If you show favoritism, this means that it has to come from you, your own thoughts, and then in your actions. Which is really interesting because there is a popular worldview out today, and there's there's popular books on racism today. Perhaps some of you have seen them, maybe you've read them. And by virtue of your skin color, you're guilty. Because you're white, you're guilty. But James says, if you show partiality, if you show partiality, you're the one who has broke the law. And so what James is saying is contrary to what this popular worldview is saying, where you are guilty by the color of your skin. That's not true. But if you have shown it, James says you have broke the law. Another thing that's interesting about this worldview is that it basically says that if you are black, you basically cannot be racist. You cannot really show partiality by virtue of your skin color. That's not true either. James is addressing the church, which is composed of both Jews and Gentiles. I'm not Jewish. And I have shown partiality, brothers and sisters. I can continue. Let me backtrack. I can still show partiality at times. So it's not by virtue of your skin color, brothers and sisters. It's as as if you think and then act on it. And merely even thinking these evil thoughts that James says you are committing sin. Now follow this point here. I think this is really interesting. James says, he who said, speaking of God, do not commit 
Adultery also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. James is, is, is trying to paint a picture here. If you think, you know what, I've, I've done really well in keeping the Ten Commandments for the most part, where I'm committed to God, I'm committed to the people of God, I'm committed to church, I don't really lie, I don't really steal, I'm faithful to my spouse. Notice how James says, if you break one, you're guilty of breaking them all. Now, why would he bring up murder? Well, I think this is interesting because Jesus says that if you hate, you have committed murder in your heart. And James says that if you love your neighbor, you're doing well. What's the opposite of that? If you're not loving your neighbor, you're not doing well. And if you're not loving, then that's hatred. And therefore, it's murder in the eyes of God. There is no room for partiality in the local church. There's no room for discrimination in our local church. This is what the people here in James' context might be forgetting. Our third point, that God is the lawgiver and judge. Verses 12 to 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, there's a theme of judgment throughout this passage. James says in verse 4, that when you make these distinctions, you've become judges amongst yourselves. Verse 12, he talks about being judged or act as being judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy. And then even what I read earlier in chapter 3, verse 1, that teachers are judged with greater strictness. So what is it? about all these judgments or judges. Well, James says in verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. How is it that a law can be of liberty? Well, it's quite interesting that the law of Christ is one of freedom. All right, here's the interesting thing about Christianity is that we cannot earn God's favor. Christ fulfilled the law on our behalf. And so now, those who are in Christ have a new heart that can obey God that can follow him, that can love him, that can love their neighbors as themselves. So it's actually freeing to obey God rather than being a slave to sin. I think that's what James is trying to get at there. And so James' conclusion is that we would speak and act in accordance with God's word or God's law specifically. And that law being loving our neighbor. Paul puts it this way when he says, love is the fulfillment of the law. Christians, churches should be marked by love. Love. 
marked by love because one, God has loved us, two, we are the people of God, and three, we are a light to the world. And what we're seeing today is so contrary to the scriptures, so contrary to the very character of God. There's so much division even amongst Christians. Brothers and sisters, we are called to love one another. We're called to pursue peace with one another, not hate. So if you're a Christian or a professing Christian, a Christ follower, and you've shown partiality towards someone else in the local church who have walked through the doors based on their economic status, their skin color, politi political affiliation, anything like that, fall on your knees in repentance. Plead with God. Say, God, I've shown favoritism towards one person or one group of people based off of this. I know, God, that you hate this. Lord, help me to love people deeply because you have loved me. Fall on your knees in repentance. Ask for more grace. It's amazing that God gives more grace to the humble. James actually says this later on in his letter. God gives more grace. Isn't that amazing and so relieving for the Christian that God gives more grace? And if you're not a Christian, if you're not someone who follows Jesus, perhaps you're wondering how it is that we can claim that God is love, but you believe that there's so much racism, especially in the church. And you're wondering how in the world do those two things fit together? Well, friend, I thank you for being here. And just know that God is rightly concerned about the purity of his church. All throughout the scriptures, we see that with God, there is no partiality. And there's a judgment that's coming, actually. God is going to judge the world through his son Jesus, where all sins will be revealed, including the sin of partiality and favoritism and discrimination. And so if you're not a Christian, I urge you to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved you will be saved. James says there's judgment without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. So in this context, mercy is actually showing love and compassion to those who are different. It's interesting because then James later on in this chapter goes on to speak about faith and works and how we show our faith by our works. So we show that we are Christians by the mercy that we show to other people, the compassion that we show to other people, the love and care that we show to other people. That's why James says, if there's a poor person in your assembly, and you just say, you know, be warm, be well, 
and don't do anything about it, how is it that you are actually reflecting Christ? So if you do not show mercy to other people, do you really comprehend and understand and have a grasp of the gospel message? Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's amazing that Christians can and should show mercy towards other people because they hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how is it that you don't show partiality or not discriminate against other people? It's because you have in mind the one who holds the church together, Jesus. The very one who, though he was poor, sorry, though he was rich, became poor for our sake. The very king who left his throne in heaven to come down and show compassion and mercy and love towards the outcast, where he himself became an outcast where he himself perfectly obeyed the law of God on our behalf, where Adam failed, where Israel failed, where all of us failed, all of us guilty because we've broken the law of God, and Jesus comes down, perfectly loving his father, perfectly loving his neighbor, and then is deemed a criminal, the very one who shows no partiality, no discrimination, no hatred, is deemed a criminal, guilty, condemned, judged by the world, judged by his father, so that he hangs on a cross, innocent, taking the very wrath of God. Jesus was judged on our behalf so that you and I and every Christian in the entire world, every Christian from history and the future, every Christian might receive mercy. And this is so amazing because today, Partiality, racism is seen as the unforgivable sin. There is a heavy guilt and burden on you because of your skin color. But there is so much grace and mercy at the cross. It's at the cross where we see the judgment of God because of our sin and the mercy of God because Christ took the judgment on our behalf so that we might be blessed. So that we can be the children of God. But that, brothers and sisters, is the very motivation the cause of us being able to love people. And so we must not forget that, that we as the people of God are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. So here's something you can do today or this week is to read or reread the parable of the Good Samaritan. Read that passage, study it, reflect on it, 
And think about how Christ has shown you much mercy in your helpless state. And so that when people walk through our doors, we can say, welcome. So glad you're here. And we can point them to Christ, which is the most loving thing that we can do. Would you pray with me? Father, you are so generous to us. You have shown us much grace and mercy. And we need to be reminded of that. And Lord, that reminds us that we are, are different now. We have been changed and transformed into the image of your son. So I pray, Lord, that we will be a people marked by love. That we will be a people who love you and love our neighbor. So give us grace to do that. Give us grace to trust you, to walk in obedience. We thank you for Christ and his faithfulness. And Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.